Welcome to I Need to Know Show, a production of the Public Trust Network. This show was created to inform Americans about the concerns and particular needs of the Puerto Rican community throughout the United States. However, our audience is not Puerto Ricans. Rather, the American public at large, who actually have the power that Puerto Ricans do not have. That is, to decide if Puerto Rico can be treated equally as all Americans under the Constitution. What? You may ask. This is not my opinion. This is what the United States Supreme Court has stated in several court decisions over the years. Many of you have heard of Puerto Rico, but many Americans do not even know where it is. What is sad to note is ever since World War I, Puerto Ricans have fought in every conflict around the world to support this nation and its principles of freedoms enshrined in the Constitution. Puerto Ricans have fought in Korea, Kuwait, Iraq, and around the world so that these people have the right to vote in a democracy of their making for their nation. Yet, Puerto Ricans on the island cannot vote themselves for their president or to have a voting voice in the Congress that sends them to war. In fact, the Supreme Court of the United States has clearly stated that Puerto Rico is governed by what is called the Territorial Clause of the Constitution and is governed by Congress, and Congress controls what rights and privileges apply to Puerto Rico uh, and Puerto Ricans on the island. The Equal Protection Clause, which covers you and me, does not apply to Puerto Ricans on the island. This program is designed to educate Americans on this issue and to create a national platform for stateside Puerto Ricans to discuss this issue and bring it to their senators and congressmen. Puerto Ricans on the island are American citizens, but are not treated like American citizens. We do not advocate for statehood or independence. That is for the citizens of the island to determine. But we Americans do have a voice on how our constitution is applied. Oh. Uh- Carlos, I know you're a professor at City University of New York at the Center, Hunter College Center for Puerto Rican Studies. I know Edwin Melendez very well for many, many years. So, por favor, mandalo saludo, okay? Come on. <laughs> okay. I know that I want to first welcome you and thank you so for joining us um, and for our, this conference that we're having of uh, Puerto Rican Bar Associations in Orlando, Florida. It's imperative, just to give you a little background, uh, because we haven't had the opportunity that you and I speak. But it is a, uh, what I'm attempting to do with this is to create a platform where uh, the voice of the Puerto Rican community and Puerto Rico itself can be heard on a national basis. Because you realize, of course, um, uh, if 100 percent of the Puerto Ricans wanted Puerto Rico to be independent or 100 percent wanted Puerto Rico to be a state, it doesn't make a difference because Congress is the one that controls the future of you know, Puerto Rico. So therefore, who really has some influence over the future of Puerto Rico is Congress. And that means that those of us who live in New York and Chicago and Illinois and, and Texas and in Florida actually are the ones that have some influence over the future of Puerto Rico and, and not the island itself. So often you have this tempest in a teapot, I call it. You know, the way they're having this argument on the island with plebiscites and total, but they have very little influence over Congress because the congressmen only, you know, are going to listen to the, the constituency. So unless we have a national platform where we can bring the diaspora, whether you like that term or not like that term, that's a way of describing the six million or so Puerto Ricans. We're going to get into that with your your conversation. It is those of us who have access to congressmen and senators that actually can make a difference for the future of Puerto Rico. So unless we have a national platform, and at this point I don't see that there is one other than research institutes like yourself. Um, but uh, I would like to see us one day be able to say like the National Rifle Association or the Christian Coalition, you bring a thousand people into a room and every political candidate, whether you're running for president or senator, has to show up. Mm-hmm. Until we have that kind of influence, Puerto Rico's voice is just not going to be heard. You know. Mm-hmm. So this is what the point of having this, uh, this conference is like. Mm-hmm. So bringing the tremendous talent that we have Puerto Rican professors like yourself 
and we have we have professors coming in from Fl Florida International, from Florida University of Central Florida, from Florida so University of South Florida, and from um, of course CUNY, and now uh, from the University of Puerto Rico. We have a a a literally all star all star uh, representation of Puerto Rican scholars coming to discuss the issues. We're not. We have no position, uh, you know, the, the itself, no political position, but we are trying to bring information. Mm -hmm. um, our objective is to, to educate that second generation of Puerto Ricans. They are born, raised in New York, like myself, who had to learn about Puerto Rico as a side thing, you know, because I learned about the Algonquins. I knew about Peter Stuyvesant, but I didn't know about the Tainos, and I knew nothing about, uh, you know, uh, Pedro Abizu Campos. I know nothing of that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I had to learn to be Puerto Rican. And there are millions of us out there who want to be Puerto Ricans but don't know anything about Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. And then comes our allies who, who are either married to Puerto Ricans or are just know of a, a, an injustice that is being carried on on this island that without their help, nothing can happen. Mm -hmm. Right? So the, the, we're hoping that this... Uh, convention or this conference is a beginning of a national platform to mobilize the Puerto Rican community and our allies into making a decision on on the future of this. Mm -hmm. So with that, uh, obviously, you know, the big migration of Puerto Ricans out of uh, Puerto Rico in the 50s or so uh, came to New York. And in New York, we had the establishment of the Puerto Rican Bar Association of New York. We had the Puerto Rican League of Defense and Education Fund. And, of course, we had the establishment of the CUNY, the, uh, the research hub at, at, at CUNY. Everyone else has been trying to mimic the, uh, that, that, uh, that development. Uh, of course, in Florida, we started our Puerto Rican Bar Association in Florida. And then at UCF, we have a research hub as well. I'm sure you've met. Uh, Fernando Rivera. So let's let's give us a brief history of the your center, what you guys do, mm -hmm. um, and the work that you do at Hunter. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you, Tony. First of all, uh, for the opportunity to come here and speak to you and your audience, I'm very happy to be in this program. I'm very happy to talk about the center and just to provide information. That is the basic. Thing that we do at the Center for Puerto Rican Studies. We provide information. We provide authoritative information. We provide university-based information, information collected and analyzed by scholars. So it has that imprimatur and it, we make it available to all Puerto Ricans irrespective of political ideology, perspectives, uh, positionings, etc. We are here to serve the Puerto Rican community. We were founded 50 years ago, and we were founded not necessarily within academic departments or what have you, but because there was an emphasis within the City University of New York and outside of the City University of New York for a place that could provide authoritative information that could sustain the nascent uh, Puerto Rican Studies Department that were created at about that time. So we were created with the Center for Puerto Rican Studies at CUNY. We were created to provide services to the departments of Puerto Rican Studies that were beginning to be uh, founded in the different colleges of the City University of New York. So we, now we continue that mission, but we've gone beyond that. Yeah, because you've done also you have publications. You have, go to your website. You'll have books that are written by authors. You have a lot of information on your website. Why don't you give us uh, uh, access to your website so we can pub publish that as well? Oh, abs absolutely. You know, we, we have the, the, the website is uh, www.centropr.hunter.cuny.edu. Uh, centropr.hunter.cuny.edu. That is our, 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 our website address. And, so, go, go ahead. Tell us what, what, was, what the stuff we could find on that website. Right. So, so you will be able to find, number one, we are research institute. We conduct research. We find and develop and create knowledge and content. 
that is not the number one thing that we do over the years we have also become a repository of that information of that knowledge and that content created by us and by others by other puerto ricans or people who are concerned about puerto rico and puerto ricans so we have a library and an archives we have the largest archives in the puerto rican population in the united states outside of puerto rico mm -hmm. uh it is unique we are the oldest, we are the largest research institute. In addition to that, in addition to having uh, the research site and having the library and the archives, which is open to the public, right? We are open right. to the public. Uh, we also provide events, events by which we seek to convey this university-based knowledge uh, to the population at large. So yeah. we are here, we are creators of knowledge. We are uh, stewards of our culture and our cultural heritage. And we are also repositories of both our knowledge, our history, and uh, the, the institutionals, uh, uh, the institutions that, you know, give us uh, mm -hmm. their documentation to preserve for uh, posterity. We're going to have to continue this some other day because there's so much to talk about, about what you do, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in the cultural aspect, because I know you did a lot of work with the Puerto Rican Parade because I was involved with that. And uh, and so there's, there's a bunch of stuff that El Centro does. Uh, right now, though, I'd like to concentrate because we're pushing now uh, and for the convention, which is coming up uh, September 28th through the 30th. And we have uh, several classes. We have eight actually classes that are going forward of several of which have been authorized by the Florida Bar Association as credited courses for those lawyers, both in New York and in, in Puerto Rico, uh, Chicago, and Florida, who attend to the courses, one of the courses which you will be participating in. Uh, so these are accredited courses. And we're bringing, we're bringing uh, you know, uh, influencers, right? And of course, the intellectuals like yourself that, to, to give information to everyone else out there. So one of the things um, that we uh, are very interested in is the demographics of Puerto Rico, and that's a specialty of yours. And so I'd like to go into that because, it, correct me if, if, uh, if I'm wrong, there are now about estimated 3.1 million Puerto Ricans on the island and an estimated 5.5 or so million Puerto Ricans or people who identify themselves as Puerto Rican on the mainland. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, in the last several years, I understand it's been about a loss of about 600,000 Puerto Ricans on the island. And that demographic loss, many could say, is a terminal democratic loss. It, it is, it, you're losing, and here in Florida, particularly after Hurricane uh, Maria, mm -hmm. and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but we had over 50,000 Puerto Ricans migrate here. Some, of course, went back, but many stayed. We have a plethora of doctors. It seems to me that we have all your doctors in Puerto Rico are here. Uh, we have they taken the middle class. We've taken the young. This is not good for the island. No. And obviously those people are coming here, not because they don't love Puerto Rico, but because the opportunities are not there. Mm -hmm. And the opportunities are here. So people are having to vote for the future and by coming to other places, of course, many are now migrating to Texas. Yeah. So, so de go ahead. definitely, uh, you know, the population of, listen, the, the year 2010 marked the first time in over 200 years that the people of Puerto Rico lost population. The, the Puerto Rico uh, as a construct lost population for the first time in more than 200 years. And it, it, we can pinpoint, we had already begun to do some research prior to the catastrophe. There were Hurricane Maria and, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the, the earthquakes and the economic crisis and COVID. Uh, and we were already beginning to project that there would be what is called a demographic winter, mm -hmm. meaning that the number, in terms of natural growth, the number mm -hmm. of birth vis-a-vis -vis deaths as well as migration was such that the Puerto Rican population would continue to decline. And we have been seeing that. The fact that, however, the biggest reason why Puerto Rico is losing population is given by the fact that the economy of Puerto Rico is not able to accommodate everybody who wants to have a job, right? Uh, uh, so, so the fact that the, we have to remember that the Great Recession uh, that it, throughout the world started in 2008, it began in Puerto Rico in 2006. From that point on, Puerto Rican began to lose population. 
and it was given mostly by uh, immigration, but also by this decline in in in, in birth rates, in, in births, right? So we see that with the decline in the economy, which coincided with the full sunset of, you know, IRC, you know, Internal Revenue Code sections 936, we saw how there was a decline in economic activity uh, that basically hit its trough uh, with Hurricane Maria, right? So the fact that the economy of Puerto Rico is not able to sustain a, a, a livelihood for many Puerto Ricans uh, explains why many are leaving the Puerto Rico, right? Now, uh, I, we can argue as to whether Section 936 is the best public policy prescription for Puerto Rico, but there is no question about the fact that for the Puerto Rican economy to grow, it needs capital investment. It needs to foster domestic investment, and it also needs to bring in investment from abroad. We can see that historically, the way that Puerto Rico grew, whether it was in the 19th century or the 20th century, it was as a result of economic incentives that at that time still today the imperial governments yeah. uh, provided the governments of spain or the governments of the united states right. um so that that's number one um and, and number two we also have to recognize that puerto rico has lost competitive economic advantage vis-a-vis -vis the countries in the circum caribbean not just mm -hmm. the other islands of the caribbean but also the countries in the caribbean basin with the uh, advent of nafta with the advent of CAFTA, Puerto Rico no longer has that advantage that it had prior to, you know, you know, a free entry of goods and services. And Operation Bootstamp, uh, Operation Bootstamp, right? The, the, it was a Munoz, Munoz Marine started. Right. So number one, you know, Puerto Rico has lost, you know, that 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 comparative advantage as producers of goods and services, and it has also lost an advantage in terms of a place where, you know, you could, you know come in and invest in Puerto Rico and provide, get, you know, a federal tax incentive of some sort. That has lost, that has contributed to the loss. So whichever political party comes to power from any of the three political persuasions, they need to address the fact that Puerto Rico needs to gain compar competitive and comparative advantage vis-a-vis -vis other countries in the Caribbean and the U.S. states. Right. So there, and that's, there's, there's the rub here. That's, that's exactly where we need to go, which is what I think is so important to have this kind of dialogue between the people who make a living like yourself uh, from doing the research, the hard research to give us the numbers and those people who, who have the uh, influencers, which is what I'm trying to do with the, with the lawyers, bringing the lawyers who often are in the legislature uh, and if they're not getting themselves indicted like that, Today, no, uh, they they're important influencers to public policy, mm -hmm. and if, if if they're not, if the public policy is not based on numbers, re good research, then we're going to go astray, and mm -hmm. people will not understand, mm -hmm. and so it it gets into culture wars or whether no, que somos Puerto Ricano, que no somos Puerto Ricano, who's on, who is Puerto Rican, who is not Puerto Rican, uh, we get into all diversion diversion, but not into the facts. Mm -hmm. Because unfortunately, economies are driven by policy and public policy has to be determined with with good facts. And right. so, you know, Puerto Rico at this point uh, has to, and the way I see this, you know, being both, I was, of course, a professor of law at, at the law school and and uh, being a politician. I was a, for a while, I, I, I took the duty of uh, as an elected official. Mm -hmm. So I've been both in the intellectual side and, of course, I've been on the, on the political side. But I see that public policy has to be driven by politics, and Puerto Rico is is defenseless because it it's on the in Washington, it has to beg for its representatives. It has to mm -hmm. beg for so Rick Scott here in Florida to mm -hmm. go down to Puerto Rico and and Rick Scott to be the advocate mm -hmm. for Puerto Rico. Uh, you know, we right now have pending. Uh, uh, one senator from Alabama who's stopping the promotion of of the um, of the top brass, you know, in the military. Why? Because he has that power by Senate rules. One senator from you know, from Alabama could stop the budget, the trillion dollar budget, but Puerto Rico has no such power. And if it was an independent nation, it would could chart its own course. It could get away from the Jones Act. It could 
It could have international policies on its own. If it was a state, it would have the ability to have a senator pr- pushing for its, 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 its objectives, you know. Mm-hmm. And the current status is it has neither here nor there. It seems to be a public policy that needs mm-hmm. to be debated mm-hmm. and it needs mm-hmm. to have and it has to come from persons like yourself. And of course, the mm-hmm. others, we will have great representatives of University of Central Florida. We will have University of South Florida. We will mm-hmm. have F- Florida International uh, University. It's going to have. So we have a real mm-hmm. great all Puerto Ricans, uh, yeah. Puerto Rican descent, at least um, professors, PhDs. They will be discussing these issues. So I know we don't have much time, and you're going to teach your class. And in, in, uh, in, we're going to, by the way, your class will be recorded, mm-hmm. and it was, it's going to be offered as a continuing yeah. education course to those in attendance. All the classes, by the way, will have 45, and they're all sold out. Okay, so mm-hmm. so uh, so we're going to have a good audience, and of course, we'll be taping it, and we'll go forward on our website mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. For those who are listening, you can go to the Public Trust Network on YouTube. Public Trust Network, and you can see those core classes that we've already, or interviews that we already have done with the presidents of the Bar Association of of Chicago, of uh, Illinois, New York, and and Florida. Those are already in the can, and you can view those. We've also interviewed the former Secretary of State of of Puerto Rico, and he's on on an uh, interview as well. So we had a uh, we have a, we're trying to make an influence. We're trying to make a difference, but. Tell us if you can, and we have a couple of minutes. Tell us what you think might be some solutions that you will throw out uh, mm-hmm. to that community when uh, you get down here to Florida. Yeah, well, one of the things that I was going to present, you know, in speaking with some of the organizers of the conference, um, you know, I wrote uh, a couple of years back uh, a demographic analysis of the growth of the Puerto Rican population throughout the country and focus on, you know, key states, New York. Florida being one of them, uh, in anticipation to the redistricting and reapportionment process. You know, this process is key. Así es como se reparte el bacalao. You, re, you, 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 you know, to reparte poder político, you, you spread political power by dividing the U.S. House of Representatives. And for that, you know, first of all, the census is crucial. So, you know, for next year, you know, we are beginning to already shape the 2030 census now, right now. Right now, the Census Bureau is eliciting information uh, and, and, and questions and, and feedback from people in anticipation of the next census. By the time the year 2020 comes in, it's going to be too late. So if you want to participate in shaping the census for 2030, now is the time, right? right. Number one. Number two, once those census uh, uh, questions are formulated, we need to make sure we answer the questions. You know, one of the problems that we as Puerto Ricans have and the larger Hispanic community is that we tend to, you know, we don't respond as often uh, to the questions and we don't respond to all of the questions. By not providing a, a, a you know, a, a, a response to the questionnaire, we are losing out information and we are losing out numbers. So it's important to answer the question. Once the numbers are collected, then comes the battle of how it is that we are going to divide the Congress of the United States. And, you know, and we are seeing how in Alabama, they're still at it because, you know, you know, they, 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 the, the legislature there has decided to draw maps in one way, which are discriminatory. Yeah. Here in New York State, we're still doing the same thing. You know, there is a couple of lawsuits uh, uh, in how it is that we're going to redistribute uh, the congressional seats. You know, so these are crucial. So what I will be presenting to uh, to the attendees of the conference is uh, how the population, the Puerto Rican population in the uh, in the state of Florida, has changed over the course of the ten uh, the past ten years, and how it is shaping to be since 2020. So yeah. I am going to see how you know, and I'm going to look at not just the congressional level. I want to pay attention to a key governmental level that we oftentimes don't pay attention to and that is the county governments right okay, okay. well you know that my uh, my specialty at the law school was voting rights okay that's <laughs> the course i taught at, at the law school so i'm very interested of course we will have latino justice now formerly known as the puerto rican legal defense and education fund as part of the panel all these discussions will be had 
And I want to thank you, Professor Carlos Vargas Ramos, a PhD from City University of New York, for joining us and coming down here. Because if we are successful, next year, of course, 2024, is the national election. And if the National Rifle Association and the Christian Coalition are able to mass and require presidential candidates to come down and meet, maybe, maybe we're lucky enough that we'll have we'll put position that we will have to have some presidential candidates join us and bring to the forefront the issue of Puerto Rico, which right now is well behind in everybody's mm -hmm. memory. It's mm -hmm. not an issue that even the Hispanic community in general is concerned about because they're concerned about immigration. But it's us, the, the, the Puerto Rican Studies Departments and the Puerto, Pilo, the Puerto Rican Bar Associations who mm -hmm. still identify as Puerto Ricans um, need to bring this issue to the forefront. And with your efforts and the research that you do and those all around the nation, we create this national platform. So I want to mm -hmm. thank you so much for joining us and being with us. Thank you. Okay. Y nos vemos pronto. Nos vemos pronto. Mm -hmm.